Okay. Next up, uh, our co-organizer, Michael Shepard, uh, Professor of Statistics from St. Lawrence. You're up, Michael. Thanks, Kevin. Good afternoon. How are we doing? <coughs> awesome. Uh, so I, I, I got to put together this session, the uh, uh, draft. Um, and so I'm going to talk uh, about a paper I did. Uh, this was part of the MIT Sloan conference last spring. Uh, and a little bit of draft by number. So, you know, uh, we, we, we picked a little bit on the leaves yet, but we haven't picked on, on some of our other targets. So, um, anybody want to know where that quote, anybody guess where that quote comes from? <laughs> and, oh yeah, there's more. And really, that's uh, where I want to go with this, is we have more than just some very basic statistics, and I'm going to talk about a, a couple of sources uh, for data, but other than performance data that we can use and we can try to build some models there. So my sort of what if, right, if we're sitting on draft day, the publicly available data we have, I think of as coming from, from sort of three sources. Right? Corey just mentioned heights and weights, age, position, those sorts of information. We also have performance. Right? We've got points per game. Uh, for skaters, we've got goalies. Right? Uh, we've got penalty information. We've got a bunch of that. And we also have some scouting information. Right? Central scouting gives us information about players, and at least in terms of their assessment. Um, and so is there a way that we can sort of combine all of that and, and try to do a good job there uh, with some prediction. Um, uh, uh, Corey alluded to it, there's lots of variation. Uh, this is hard. Right? We're projecting in a couple cases, in many cases, we're projecting what a player is going to be in three, four, five years. Uh, and that can be, can be difficult. So here, what I've got for you, right? Uh, two cohorts here, 98 to 2002. Again, 54.6% actually play, right? Uh, zero games in the NHL, right? 55.3 percent then from 2003 to 2007. You know, we we moved to 25th percentile of players who actually played a game, only getting to 18 games played, right? And so then you've got I've also got some information there on games played and time on ice here. Um, and in every draft from 98 to 2008, the engaged play of selections is zero. This is hard. And so it's a challenge. Uh, well, yeah, I mentioned that. Just quick histograms. Time on ice, games played. I'm going to use first seven years of games played and time on ice. Roughly that's what an NHL team gets for sort of a, a restricted contract for a player. So you've got this window. Uh, and before they hit free agents. Um, and, and additionally, right, the feedback loop is, is, is slow. Um, this is an app that a student of mine is working on. Uh, this is um, first five picks, second five picks. So each bar represents five picks. We've got from zero to 100 here. This is minutes played per year. And so first year, light blue, second year, red. All right, we can notice right, that blue and that red, very, very small once we get down into that second round. All right, it's taking a couple of years for those players to, uh, and I, an education per person might say, matriculate right, into the NHL and get some time on ice. Right. Um, there have been some attempts and some work uh, on this with some various pieces there. Um, Rob's done some stuff, Gabe's done some things, uh, and some others there. In terms of translation, right? We're coming from the Swedish Elite League, we're coming from NCAA. What does that look like in the, right, Corey referred to as draft plus one, right? Or from, from one year to the next, excuse me. Um, I use the Central Scout Integrator, which is Ian Fife's way of saying, how do I take, because what Central Scouting does is they take their rankings and they separate them into four pots. There's North American skaters, North American goalies, uh, European skaters, European goalies. 
there. So we we'll use some of that. Uh, the folks uh, now with Florida uh, have done a bunch of things on prop board cohort success there. Um, and when we were started with this, they had only put out their stuff that was on forward. So we're trying to do, or I'm trying to do here, forwards, defense, goalies. Uh, and I'll point out another paper that I did with um, my friend Steve Argeris here, where we showed that the NHL actually beat central scouting. So NHL scouts are doing better than central scouting. I'm going to use central scouting here because it's available to me. I've got uh, Ian Fife, uh central scouting uh, integrator, which I'm going to call Sesson um, here. And so we'll take that and we'll use that. But uh, teams do do better than central scouting. They've got other additional information. They use that. Um, Steve's a financial guy, so he thinks about things in the market. He thinks central scouting we think of in that paper as the market. Okay, um, for what I'm going to present today, this is the data merged, uh, some manual collection, some automated. Um, we're going to look at 98, 99, 2000 draft class. Uh, we've got five sites there from which we drew all of this information. Um, try to automate some manual, make sure you check your site usage agreements. A um, couple of fun facts there. Um, so, 821 players drafted or ranked by Central Scouting. So my pool of players I would consider is either drafted or ranked by Central Scouting. Uh, breakdowns by positions there, most common leagues, OHL, WHL, and NCAA. Um, and oh, the joy, um, somewhere in here there were five Robin Olsons, two forwards, two D, and a goalie from Sweden born in 89 or 90. That, yeah, back to that by hand. So what we have in here is a lot of non-linearities, and we're going to try and deal with that. This is the relationship uh, games played in the first seven years by Sesson, by Central Scouting. So first off, it is monotone decreasing, which is really nice, right? Central Scouting, on average, is doing better, with a little bit of bump there. Uh, but in general, we've got this sort of decrease and it is fairly uh, non-linear. Um, another sort of non-linearity we're going to try to deal with, right? this is, again, first seven games played. This is what Corey was referring to as draft minus one points per game. And I've just broken it down in positions here, so center, D, and forward. Uh, and what we're getting is an effect. Right? There aren't many D who are getting us a point per game. But certainly those that do, we end up with a lot more. We end up with a lot. <laughs> we end up with a lot. Yeah, yeah we, we, we're going to see those folks having, having better performance in their career. Uh, and again, uh, we would expect a lot of D down here, and, and we would for relative performance other positions similar, but we've got different sort of growth there. Uh, probably out here, that's probably a little bit of noise, not much data uh, out there uh, for those curves, but we've done a little bit of smoothing there. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and model all of these positions together at once. And so we're obviously going to have some position effects in there as part of our model. I'm going to use first seven years time on ice or first seven years games played as my two responses. I'll look at both. Uh, the results end up being fairly similar. Uh, I'm going to use, so this is the stat geek part here, right? I'm going to use a generalized additive model um, with a log link. So we're doing some log linear stuff, but the way we're doing it is we're allowing the way the variables get added in to be nonlinear. So they're still going to add, but they're going to add nonlinear, potentially nonlinear relationships together. Uh, so that's a local <coughs> package in R. And our, our, our predictions are going to be the, the ones that we've got there. And then some interactions. We have definitely different effects by position, right? Points per game, as we saw by position, uh, those things matter. Uh, one thing I'll point out here in terms of this data. Um, for goalies, we've only got goals against average, right? So this is fairly historical. If we were to go back and look, uh, 
going forward, we would have more than that, um, but historically, uh, we don't have that. Um, so we're going to train on 98, 99, 2000 draft classes. Um, again, the players that we're looking at were the ones drafted and, and ranked by Central Scouting. Uh, out of sample, we're going to pick the 2007-2008 drafts. Uh, again, our responses here. My criterion here is going to be the rank correlation between the actual performance they had for seven years in the NHL and when they were drafted. Um, and the, the reason for picking a rank correlation versus a straight performance correlation is that in reality in the draft, we actually have to, we make some automatic ranking. We are ranking players there by how we select them. Um, so some results here. So those are the training years out of sample 2007. The draft order correlation, actually these correlations should be um, negative in terms of draft <coughs> order, but to give us the same sort of magnitudes here. For time on ice and for games played is about the same. 0.547, so that's how teams get. Um, and our model was able to get a little bit higher than that. So 0.65 versus 0.54. 2008, same sort of results. We don't do quite as well uh, with our model there, um, but we do, uh, do beat the draft. Um, just note this that recently came out. So Mike Lopez did the top 60 picks um, across a couple of leagues. And note here we've got Major League Baseball, NBA, NFL, uh, and NHL. Um, interesting that you've got this uptick in the NHL. A um, couple of possibilities there. Uh, the NHL is drafting better and better. Uh, that would be one. The other is you still have some players, uh, particularly from some of these end years, that haven't quite made it to the league yet, and so you're seeing the top players there, but not necessarily those who are taking two or three years to develop. Uh, it is interesting to see the, sort of a cross-league comparison there. Uh, interesting also that, that uh, Major League Baseball doesn't do as well as, as other leagues there. Um, just a, a, a note of what we did in terms of predictions um, for last year. Um, so those were the top ten coming out of the model. Um, I consider that a little bit lucky. Um, in, in terms of that, we did like... Oh, oops. Uh, we did like McAvoy a bit more um, than when he was just ranked by some other teams. We've got central scouting's uh, individual rankings there. Um, one thing that the model does like very much uh, is actually what I would call dense players. Um, so one of the predictors that is in there is the ratio of weight to height. Um, and so dense short players tend to do uh, pretty well under that metric. So that is one, uh, one reason we see some of those folks there. Um, so uh, this was really mostly a proof of concept. Um, we're really only using one year. We're only using draft minus one. Certainly we now have potentially draft minus two and draft minus three, which could be included and improved. <laughs> Um, we, we, for some of the years, so if I were to use 2007-2008 to predict 2016-17, could probably get the same percentage um, from the pre-draft league. Um, there's other things in there that, that I think would be really helpful. What was the quality of the team you were on? Um, how many other players on your team were ranked by Central Scout? Uh, those sorts of things and knowing that probably pay, plays into some of the other variation uh, that we've got playing on a national team, those sorts of questions. So, thank you. Why you took the approach that you did? 
uh, points per game as a predictor or as an outcome? Uh, I guess both. Um, so, so points per game uh, is in there as a predictor, um, for sure. Um, I didn't use it as an outcome because I certainly think you end up favoring forwards over D. So I, I, I'm pretty consistently stuck with games played and time on ice as an outcome, as a way to make comparison. Um, I will address that by saying, um, looked and, and did it with, with this model as well of doing, uh, because defensemen tend to play more, doing some sort of adjustment in terms of time on ice, sort of you know, subtracting 20% and looking, and, and the results are roughly the same um, if we do that. Uh, 1999 was sorry. Okay, 1999 was a particularly mediocre draft for Rowling 10. Do you think it uh, maybe advertised your uh, your reasoning because of that, or uh, it, it certainly could? Yeah, um, I haven't gone back and looked specifically at that. Okay. Um, but Patrick Stefan was the first overall draft. Uh, to <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, so my question is about uh, height and weight, because you mentioned that you use a few different data sources, and you know, as we know, players they will tend to either grow or gain muscle mass, and even aside from that, there's just a lot of inconsistencies in how height and weight are measured. So, so how, like, what kind of issues have you run into in that regard? Uh, so, so first, I didn't mention it, but as much as possible, we try to ensure that what we were getting was was draft day height and weight. Um, so there's that. Uh, obviously, there's plenty of noise uh, in all of it. Um, you know, I think the data gets better and better now. I mean, you've got some combine things, you've got those sorts of things going on where you're going to get more consistency. Historically, there's plenty of plenty of noise in there. There's no doubt about that. Um, you know, and and what is reported. Uh, on draft day in 2002 for a player from University of Denver. Uh, yeah, I don't know how accurate that is. Uh, I guess I'm assuming that, that that sort of accuracy or that level of noise carries through from, from then to now. Last question. How much does the, uh, the league that the player is playing at the time come into, uh, come into consideration? Is that, uh, is that something that you put you weigh in heavily on or, or not? Because I'm assuming there are some leagues that are you know, more defensive minded, some that are more offensive minded. So I'm just wondering how much that plays into it. Uh, it, it certainly plays a big amount. Uh, you know, certainly if you've got 50 games from somebody playing in the OHL versus you know, maybe a 17, 18 year old who gets promoted to the Finnish first division for the second half of the season, you know, uh, the number of games that they play in that league is important. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, last presenter of this session, uh, Timo Sapa.